Good afternoon and welcome to our fifth in our series, actually our fourth in our fall presentation series here at Integrated Design Lab. Um, this is our second in the last series. Our next talk will be uh, November 18th and that talk will be uh, Deep Energy Savings Through Existing Building Renewal. It will be kind of a panel discussion like that. But tonight we're talking about um, the Banner Bank and continuous improvement at that facility. We have Mike Murnahan here who's the uh, building operator at the Banner Bank, and Darwin Roy um, from Climate Tech. He was a very pivotal um, subcontractor in getting this building to operate the way it was intended to operate. Um, first of all, we just need to put a big thanks out to our funders, Better Bricks, Idaho Power, and the Northwest Energy Association. Um, without our funders, of course, we wouldn't be here. And hello to everyone out there um, on the internet. Uh, don't forget, if you have any questions, you can email in, and we can get those addressed right away. Just email to idl at uidaho.edu. Um, I believe that, that uh, is also on the website as well. Um, and another announcement, uh, this coming Tuesday, November 9th, we're hosting a webinar here at the lab on infrared cameras and how to use those cameras. That's from 12 until 1.30 at the brown bag lunch. So. Um, don't forget about that. Also, everyone here, don't forget to sign in so you can get some AIA continuing education credits. And we're also going to be handing out evaluations towards the end of the presentation. So um, please make sure to fill out the evaluations. You know, feedback is very important, right? How these control systems work without feedback, right? That's right. Okay. That's you got to have. You got to have. All right. Well, uh, Gary Christensen is out of the country. His son is getting <coughs> married this weekend, so I'm going to fill in for Gary here at the beginning of the talk. I know I'm not as good looking as Gary, but I think I'm funnier. <laughs> so, so you got that going for us. But anyway, um, when Gary and his team started to design the Banner Bank, they knew that they wanted to go for lead rating, they wanted to go for lead platinum, and they did the core and shell rating. But they didn't just look at the lead checklist and start <coughs> mindlessly figuring out, you know, what they could afford to put into the building. Gary really looked at that lead checklist and he said, what's the design intent behind each of these points we can get? Why are they asking us to do this? What is env what's environmentally responsible about this point? So he was able to teach himself how to um, build a building with the spirit of lead rather than just marking things off the checklist. And I think that was, that was hugely important um, for him, and it was um, a great way to approach a lead type project. Um, he would ask questions like, you know, what strategies or systems can we use to, to, to get this point, and how is this point going to make our building more sustainable? So I think that was a really um, great approach and something I think we could all take away. Um, Gary also says that, you know, they did a great job on this building, but of course, you know, in the spirit of continuous improvement, which is what our whole series here is about, that there are things they could improve upon. Um, some of the main uh, points which he felt he would do different next time are uh, building commissioning, uh, building controls, which is why Darwin is here, and building operations and maintenance, which is Mike's forte. Um, so those three points, Gary, Gary says he'd really focus on diff differently the next time. And the first one of those was building commissioning. And in my opinion, um, if he would have had a building commissioning process, those other two points would have kind of taken care of themselves. You know, they wouldn't even be on the list. Um, and I'm going to, um, I'm paraphrasing mainly here, but I want to read this part about commissioning that Gary wrote because um, commissioning is such a powerful process. It is fairly poorly understood by the practitioners out there now. And um, so I think it, it really means something to hear the words right out of the mouth of a developer that really um, understands the, the process now a lot better. Unfortunately, it's in hindsight. So um, Gary says, I didn't really understand what commissioning was all about. As a result, I didn't give our commissioning agent enough clout. He needed veto power, and I, Gary, didn't give it to him. Next time, he or she will be much more involved from the beginning of the process and we'll have a comprehensive commissioning process prepared prior to the start of con construction so everyone knows what's going to happen 
and when. And I just love that statement because it hits all of the major points. The commissioning agent needs to have absolute power, you know, answering only to the owner. Uh, the commissioning agent needs to be involved early in the process and they need to bring everyone together so everyone understands what's going to be expected with them in the process. And then Gary goes on to talk a little about, about building controls. Um, you know, he likens building controls to the brain of your building. And if you think about that, you know, we could cut off a foot and we could still limp around, right? But if we lose our brain, we're dead. So, you know, if you think about controls like that, you know, when we have high performance buildings that we have nowadays, you really need the, the controls to be working well. And of course, you need the controls contractor to be at the table up front and, you know, as part of that integrated design process and in that commissioning process so you can make sure all your control points are in place and you're going to be able to operate your building as it's intended to operate. <clears throat> and then of course um, after your building's commissioned and operating correctly you've got the um, operation and maintenance part and again building commissioning a thorough building commissioning process develops a really good operations manual for you it does training of the operators and things like that but you need excellent um, well-trained people like Mike here to operate the building to make sure that okay we commissioned it it is it is operating the way it's designed and now we need to keep this building operating the way it's designed and that of course is very important um, well I think at that I'll just hand it over to Darwin and Mike and thank you guys for coming Thank you, Brad. <clears throat> I don't, am I on? Is my mic turned on? I, I'm, I'm running? Okay, good. <clears throat> uh, as Brad said, I, my name is Darwin Roy. I'm with Climatech Corporation. We're uh, a local HVAC service and maintenance company as well as a control contractor. And, <clears throat> I, uh, and I'm going to introduce one more uh, fellow. That, his name is John Westrom. Uh, John, formerly with Hydro Power Company, uh, and has joined our group here recently. And he's going to talk to you a little bit about some of the energy numbers at the end of it because he's, he put together the numbers. And, and besides that, he's a hell of a lot smarter than I am. But I'm better looking than him. So, <laughs> um, I put up this, head, this thing here. Is that the Banner Bank building. Yeah, they told me if I walk in front of that, it would be harder for you guys to see it. The uh, <clears throat> Banner Bank building, it's a lead platinum. It's the story of what should have been and what wasn't and what it became because it went through all those. It, it, had a, it, had, it had tremendous promise from an energy standpoint and cover standpoint. It was a failure, but now it again it's a success and there's a, a multiple reasons for that. The language of our day, green, sustainability, global warming, lead, lead certified, lead silver, gold, and the top lead platinum. Environmental responsibility. Gary Christensen recognized environmental responsibility when he built the global, I mean the Banner Bank building. And why do we, why should we be environmentally responsible? For our children's, children's, children. <clears throat> Sometimes people say, you need to do these things for the life of the planet. And I promise you, this planet will be here. This planet is not in trouble. This planet's going to go on. This planet's gone through stuff that, you know, way uh, different than what we're talking about. We need to be environmentally responsible for the life of us. Because if we don't, we're not going to have a place to live. The planet will go on, I promise you. But all these things, these environmental responsibilities are just fine. But if you're in business, I'm in business, I'm a businessman. If you're in business, you have to respect the bottom line. You have, you have employees to pay. You have a banker to, to pay. If you're a public, publicly traded corporation, you have, you have your shareholders to pay. You have to be, you know, uh, not just environmentally responsible, but you have to be economically responsible. And that was what Gary recognized early on. And Gary early on began to say green is the color of money because he felt that if he built the right building, that he could have not only the right environmental impact, but also the right economic impact 
for himself and for his tenants and, and frankly, for his bankers. Cost-effective sustainability. That's what he was looking for. That's what he was striving for. The term sustainability, I, I, I think about that a lot. The, I, so I, I, I looked it up. And, uh, and I'll bet you guys don't believe I went to the shelf and pulled off a dictionary and looked it up in the dictionary, do you? I, I, just, I went to the internet and looked it up like we all do these days. But it says, sustain is to keep up or keep going as an action or process. So let's talk a little bit about lead. Lead is the leadership in energy and environmental design. And I underline the word design. Hang on just a minute here. Okay. I think I have a slide out of place here. And design Design is an event. Yeah, I mean, it's a process. It takes time. It, you go through, you know, all of the reviews, the discussion, the, the, all those decisions. But in the end, design is an event. It's completed, it's handed off, and a building is constructed. Sustainability is a process. It's not an event. It's a process. It's a commitment. It's a lifetime. The efficiency of a chiller can be verified. You can go out and you, can, you get the EER on it, and you can say, yep, this chiller's, you know, will provide you, uh, uh, you know, 15 BTUs per watt. It's a good chiller. We can verify that. Efficiency of a boiler. You can, you can get the combustion efficiency. Uh, and, and you can verify the efficiency of a boiler. Or a window. You can get the U value. Or insulation. You can get the R value. You can verify all those things. And again, I've got, I apologize for having some stuff out of whack there. Oh, it's all Mike's fault. He was helping me do it, so. By the way, I should, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step back a little bit. Uh, Mike and I don't have, you know, a, 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 an hour's worth of presentation uh, done. And so this is a conversation that we're having with you folks. And so if you have questions at any time, uh, you know, feel free to just say, hey, wait a minute, I, I, I need to know more about that. And, and if you do, there's a good possibility Mike can answer them, because I'm not sure I would be able to. So anyway, so we talked about the, you, know, you can verify the efficiency of a chiller, of a, a boiler, insulation, windows. You can verify all of these things before you ever begin to build the building. And, and the architects and the engineers can approve those. They say, yep, that's efficient boiler. That's an efficient a chiller. But the efficiency of a control system is in the program. And that program, while every control contractor has some master programs that they go back to, every control program is written specific to every building. And so prior to the control system being purchased, you cannot verify the efficiency of it. You can't verify that that control system does, is going to do what it's supposed to do. You can only verify it after the fact. And we talk about commissioning, and, and, and I think commissioning, uh, you, you have to have commissioning for high efficiency buildings. And they have to have clout. So that, was a, that, was a, that was a major thing that, that, as Gary acknowledged, he did wrong. He didn't give his commissioning agent enough clout. <clears throat> but but I've, been, I've been part of construction projects <clears throat> where they had all the clout, I should say, part of the construction. I've been come in after the fact, after construction projects, where the commissioning agent had the clout, and in the end, they still didn't. The, the building owner still didn't get what they wanted. It just it gets to be a point. That, you, know, you, you can dig through. A, you know, the contractor can dig through the specs. He can find something. In the end, they didn't get what they wanted. And and the Manor Bank building had a had a great commissioning agent. They had uh, uh, Solark out of Eugene, uh, uh, John uh, Alberti from Solark was, was the agent on site, Mike, uh, uh, pardon? Mike Hatton. Mike Hatton, thank you, uh, of Solark was, you know, was the lead guy on it. Great company, good folks. 
you know, Mike's originally from Boise here, they, uh, uh, they were a good commission agent, but they didn't have the clout. Wait a minute, I have to see what's wrong. Hell, I'm not running my slide program. Here, I'm just going to... Why don't, you guys are all smart, why don't somebody tell me that? I still got a metal step here. The, so the efficiency of the control system is, is, in, the, is in the programming. The fish, and, and as Gary commented, the control system is the brains of the building. I mean, you have a pump and you, and you have a whole plumbing system. You got, the, you got the life flow, the fluid flow of the building, just like the heart. And you got the lungs of the building. You have the, you have the, you have the fans, the air handlers, the lungs of the building that, that breathe in and out. But nothing happens without the right signals from the brain. So you can have the most efficient uh, uh, equipment. You can have the most efficient systems, you can have the most efficient building, you can, have, you can have the best windows and the best insulation, you can have all those things right. But if the brain doesn't tell those mechanical systems how to do it, when to do it, and how to do it right, it's all gone, it's all by the wayside. And the efficiency of the system is, 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 is in the co commitment of, a, of the control contractor. Excuse me, I'm gonna go back up. The commitment of the control contractor because the banner was cutting edge for us here in Boise. It was right up, you know, they were pushing the envelope. They were, the, the how many lead platinum buildings were there in the world prior to banner? 18, it was the 19th lead platinum building in the world. And there weren't a lot of them in Idaho for that first 18. In fact, there were none. And so it was out, we're pushing the envelope. And, and when a, a control contractor gets into a contract like that, they have to be committed to it. Because there's going to be things come along that just don't work quite the way we all planned them to. The underfloor design, uh, you know, Jerry, Gary talks about, you know, York provided them a design support on the early part, and then they changed it, and then they changed it again because it was all right out on the edge. I mean, the York's underfloor design has been around a long time, but York was doing some different things with a variable volume underfloor system. So the, the control contractor has to be committed to the project. He's got to be committed to the design intent, got to be committed to the success. And the efficiency of a control system is the commitment of the building operator. That if, if Banner did not have Mike, they would not be working the way they're working today. They would not have the continuous improvement that you're going to see some information about here later. So when we talk about sustainability, we're talking about not something that happened in design, some of it should happen in construction, but in the long term, it has to happen in the process. It's the lifetime of the building that is sustainability. Okay, and I'm, this I'm going to turn it over to Mike, and he's going to have a couple comments to you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, um, when I first came on board on the Banner Bank building, um, well, first of all, let me just say, everything that Brad said about a commissioning agent is, I, I can't say enough about it. Um, <clears throat> commissioning agent needs um, to have some say in the process. It needs to be able to, you know, have some veto power also. Um, all the people we had working for us were good people. Unfortunately, they just didn't have the power maybe to say yes or no to a few things. And um, luckily when I came aboard, I had known Gary for a long time. and. Uh, I had, uh, I wasn't afraid of him, first of all, <laughs> and I was able to say yes or no, or we need this, or we need that, and um, he gave us the opportunity to, to get things right, uh, to do a few things. But my, f first of all, um, my commitment to the building came to, down to this, is I was listening to the tenants, 
uh, we already had a building. At that time, I think we had probably about uh, three floors f occupied. And you know, we were looking to get the, the building completely full. And, I, and I'm scratching my head going, okay, well, why isn't this thing working like we said it was gonna work? And the, uh, and the question was, well, call the control guy, call the controls guy. And that went back and forth for a while. We come, we, we do a few things. It still's not working. I'm thinking, man, something, something, something's not just right. And finally, we got out of them that, well, basically, we, we had bought a warehouse system, a basically a bare bone system that it's good for a shell and core. But now, if you wanted to get it to actually working how we thought it was going to work, how we wanted it to work, uh, it was going to be a lot more investment, a lot more money. And um, wasn't quite, I think, what Gary had bought. So at that time, we brought it all back down to the drawing board. Well, if we're going to do that, let's, let's just get something we really want. It gave us the opportunity to go out there and do a little shopping and uh, to interview some people but, uh, and, and some contractors and find out, okay, well, you know, if we're going to do this, let's just do it the whole way. Let's, let's get this whole building you know, working um, to the point where you know, it's easy to maintain. So, um, basically, so it came down to why we did it is it, it came to the tenants. You know, we had a building downtown. And we had 11 stories of tenant space, and we wanted it full. We wanted them there. We wanted them there for a long time. Um, I'm proud to say that we do have a, a, a full build, building, and, we have, and we've had tenants who do stay. And um, so um, that was our motivation. You know, the bottom line is, yeah, we're a business, and we need to make money. To make money, we've got to have a product that's good, that people want to stay, and they'll be around for a while. So that was my motivation. Um, my boss, I had to make sure my, you know, made my boss happy, and to make the building work. You know, we had a, we had a lot of claims we were putting out there, and we wanted to make sure we could back some of them up, back them all up. Um, so, you know, we know what it could be. You know, we, you know, if you build a building and you say it's one of the not only 19 buildings like this in the world, you know, you, you want to make sure it's a comfortable building for people to be in it and they enjoy it. Or they're going to come in and go, well, why have a building like this? It's, it doesn't do what he says. And, it's not very comfortable, and maybe maybe this whole lead program doesn't work. So we had a lot of reputation. We had a lot of uh, we had a reputation of the whole lead program here in Boise, kind of riding on our backs a little bit. Um, so um, so like I said, we needed to figure out what it wasn't, but what it could be, what what it, why it wasn't what it could be or what it should be. And um, so we started off um, identifying problems first of all. In other words, okay, we had a, a problem in, in the um, in the lobby where it was it was cold. It was very very cold, and uh, so we would have these roundtable discussions. We would bring people in. We go, okay, how are we going to solve this problem? Why is it so cold? It, or is the heating it, it, we we don't have enough heat? Uh, do we need to put more reheats in the program? Is there a stoppage in the in the uh, in the in the flow of the geothermal? And we couldn't and we had a lot of back and forth, back and forth. And so we decided, well, we'll put a vestibule in. We'll put a glass partition up, and it'll block some of the, when the doors open up, it'll block the cold air from coming in. And about this time, uh, Climate Tech came and was going to take a look at our building, our control systems. We had hired them to take a look at uh, redoing the, the, uh, the building uh, controls. And they said, oh, we can solve this. It's just a pressure issue. Now, we already bought the, Twenty thousand dollars worth of glass, so that that was coming. We, we and it looks nice, so we weren't too upset about it. But in a matter of a couple of days, with uh, doing some tweaking and and doing some adjusting, uh, we were able to raise the temperature to was a very warm lobby. And then on top of that, what we ended up doing, um, we decided that we had a heat ejection where we, we were taking the uh, Dakin units and we were ejecting the the heat um, that came from the Dakin units into the cold water loop and we're running through the chiller. Well, the problem with that is we had to run the pumps 24 hours a day and the chill had to run and winter was coming up. And so what we ended up doing is we ended up uh, um, bleeding off the water from the, from the heat from the cold water loop and using that to heat the, the downstairs. So we could heat 24 hours in the winter time, we could heat 24 hours a day. The chiller wasn't working, uh, wasn't being used. It was just all heat coming off the computer systems, the computer centers in the building. Um, and that was something, once again, that uh, um, David Gardner with Climate Tech, he was able to come in and, and, and say, well, we can do that. It wasn't, in the, it wasn't in the scope of work that we had said, you know, we were hiring for this. 
But they saw an opportunity. We saw a problem, and they took it, and they go, we can do this. Um, the other one was excessive geothermal uh, usage. Uh, there was a time when we first started that the, uh, they were calling us going, what is going on down there? You I mean, do you guys have all the valves open? And we had no control over the valves. And basically, water was coming in. We weren't re reaching our, uh, our um, uh, we were just weren't taking advantage of, of the systems we had in place. And we were able to, with, with, once again, with the health of climate tech, with the control systems, to start doing, um, having better usage and, and, and uh, having better use of a geothermal usage to the point now that I, I think we're one of the best buildings in town. And we're always constantly, the, the, uh, the, the water company's constantly calling us up going, how are you doing this? What are you doing? What are you doing right? And it's all just a matter of controls. At that, I'll give it back to uh, Darren. Mike referred several times to Dave Gardner. Uh, he's our application engineer that wrote the software for this integration project. And uh, so I, I want to make it real clear, Dave's the smart guy in our company, not me. So um, the... Uh, uh, when, when Mike just said a moment ago, he said that wasn't part of the scope of work that we took on is to do that, some of those things. Uh, and a little bit more explanation. The Banner Bank building has several, has added several data centers that was not part of the original design of the HVAC system. And so when they added those, they put on water-cooled air conditioners to, to maintain the temperature in those data centers. And so the thought was that we're, they were going to go ahead and use the chilled water system to dump the heat off those water-cooled air conditioners, dump it into that geothermal, into that uh, chilled water system. And, and as long as the chillers were running in the summertime, it worked okay. I mean, they'd dump the heat into the, ch the chilled water loop, the chiller would eventually get rid of that heat. But in the wintertime, when the chillers weren't running, they didn't have enough just convection uh, losses off that, off that loop to get rid of that heat. And so Mike would have to go down and, and, and run, the, uh, run the chiller in the middle of the wintertime just to get to reject the heat from that loop. I, I should also say that, that uh, during those first couple of years of Mike running, trying to run the, you know, the, the, the Banner Bank building, he, he got to the point where his kids forgot what he looked like. He spent all of his time down there. I mean, he lived down there. You know? He was up early in the morning, he was down there late at night, he was down there on Saturdays, down there on Sundays, because he basically operated the building manually. And uh, I'm sorry, never living air handling air handling units, the chiller, um, uh, cold water pumps, hot water pumps, uh, we had a lot of equipment and basically it was just me doing it. And so it was running around, I would probably spend maybe at a 10 hour day, probably six of it, just on control systems and then trying to get everything just balanced. A comment earlier on, earlier on today, he said, he said, if anybody called me to tell him and told me that the, that the toilet paper was out of the bathroom, he said, probably was going to get changed that day because I was spending all my time in front of the, you know, the computer trying to run the control system. So a little bit about the control system down there. Uh, Banner Bank had three DDC control systems. Uh, the, the central plant, the central uh, pl uh, plant equipment, the, the chiller, the geothermal system, the pumps, and the 11 air handlers, and all associated uh, controls with those valves, uh, dampers, et cetera, were controlled by a, a, um, a, a different control system that had, it was a native backnet system. And the, uh, uh, so that, that was all native. Now, the zones around the building, uh, the underfloor zones, the, uh, the York boxes, were controlled by the York OEM controls. They had OEM controls on them. And, but they had provided a backnet integration module so that the native backnet system could talk to those zones. So the, but it was a, they had to be integrated. And then they had some Modbus integration. They had some of the equipment uh, in the building. The, the variable frequency drives primarily used a communication protocol called Modbus. And uh, so, but, but they, the Modbus was talking some to the original control system and the variable frequency drives, but, but everything else was disconnected. So that was, just, that was the system we found. Oh, and also, I also want to comment that he said it wasn't part of the scope of our job, and then I got sidetracked. <laughs> it wasn't part of the scope of our job, and that's not true, because, uh, because when Gary hired us, uh, he said, uh, uh, I'm, I want the building to work. And, so, and I said, it will. And when we're done, it's going to work, and it's going to work right. 
And so the scope of our job was that. And it wasn't, wasn't to say, you know, we had X number of points, it wasn't to say we had X number of, none of those things, it was just simply a, one simple statement. We're gonna make the building work. That was, our, that, was our, that was our scope, that was our commitment. So <clears throat> in the three DDC systems had over 3,200 control points that we had to integrate to. Some of the problems. Uh, the integration between the zones and the central system was not completed. Training had been insufficient. And the physical installation of some of the components had not been implemented effectively, properly. Mike talked about the, the pressure issue in the building was, was, was not any control magic. It was just simply the fact that the pressure sensing devices had not been installed the way they should have been installed. And operation, as I said, was essentially manual. So the challenges, our challenges were to integrate 600 central system points from the, from the, uh, from the native backnet system without the cooperation of the original vendor in a, in a software that we didn't know, uh, the programming software that we didn't know, and without the documentation that we should have had. And, and we received documentation, and the way a backnet system works is that there's a, there's a it's called an instance number, and basically it, in computer language it's an address, it's a number. And that number is associated with a point. So it says, this instant number is the supply air temperature on air handling unit four. But when we got there, we found out that that instance number was associated with the hot water, leaving hot water system on the pumps. And that was probably, we had documentation on less than half the points, and the documentation we had was probably 80% uh, incorrect. So that's the, that was the challenge for our, for our uh, application engineer. Yes, sir. Why did you not have cooperation from the vendor and why did you not have documentation? Uh, we didn't have documentation because it was not provided at the end of the project. And as far as the cooperation of the original vendor, uh, they were the competitor that we bid against originally. And at that point in time, uh, they, they probably wasn't going to come back and help us a lot. They hadn't gone back and helped Gary, so I, I, it was my assumption they weren't going to come back and help. But I didn't, frankly, ask them. But, but uh, you were competing bidders on the original project. I was. Oh yeah, yeah. And and uh, but someone else thought they could do it a, a whole lot cheaper than we could. So than we thought we could. So. So, the challenges. Uh, some additional challenges on the zone controls. There was about 2,600 points on the zone controls. Can't remember how many other boxes we figured there were. 11 floors, or 10 underfloor uh, floors, and and I can't. We estimated. I think. Well, I shouldn't I say we accounted them at one point. Uh, three or 400 boxes that we had to control. Each of them with multiple points. The supply, or te you know, the supply, the zone supply temperature, or the zone temperature. Uh, some of the uh, the damper operations, et cetera, we had we had about 2,600 control points, but we didn't have direct control of those points. And by that I mean that in the in the native backnet controllers, we because they were backnet and because the control points were capable of speaking backnet, we could talk directly to that point, and we could tell it what we wanted to do. We could get information back from the you know the, the conditions the information input, the pressures, the temperatures, et cetera, we could read those directly in BACnet. And the outputs, the damper operation, the valve movement, the fan on and off, we could command those directly through BACnet. But on the, on the zone controllers, we were talking through an intermediary, uh, talking through a router. And we had limited read-write access to those points. And, and probably my Probably my favorite example was that we could tell that controller what the set point was. But the set point had a, had a, uh, uh, had, we could, we could give it a set point and we could give it a dead band and the maximum dead band we could give it was five degrees. So if we set that control set point in that room at 72 and a half degrees, the cooling set point would be 75 and the heating set point would be 70 based on that midpoint set point with a five degree dead band. And that's all we, and that's all we had. 
That doesn't work bad. Right up until you want to go to an unoccupied mode. When you go to an unoccupied mode, you might want to change the cooling set point to 85 and the heating set point to 60. And you only got a five degree dead band. It's really tough to get there. So one of the challenges for, for, for Dave Gardner, our, our application engineer, was to figure out how to control an unoccupied set point when he only had a five degree dead band. And, and I'm a pretty damn good programmer. But I got in there and Dave had me scratching my head about he, he has a methodology where he slides the, he slides the set point up and down as the conditions in, uh, in the space change so that he can achieve an 80 degree, 85 degree set point when the building is unoccupied, cooling set point, and a 60 degree unoccupied set point for heating. It, it, was, it was a bit of genius as far as I can But that was a challenge, a major challenge. But the result was an integrated operation that finally delivers automated operations and achieves comfort and has saved over $62,000 for Gary over the last two years. The sustainability, and again, the sustainability is what is going to happen from this point forward. The operator, the building operator is trained. He can manage his building. He, continue to, he can continue to work to optimize the system operation, and he does. And he does. He's, he has the commitment. He will continue to make that building more efficient over time. The commitment on Gary's part, he has committed to the operation, the, uh, the maintenance of the mechanical systems. We have a mechanical service contract there. He's committed to maintaining the mechanical systems, to the to the dampers that control the outside air, to the valves that control the flow of the water, to the, to the pumps that pump it, and to the fans themselves that will move it, and the coils that have to be clean in order to have efficient operations. He's committed to that sustainability. And he's also committed to the maintenance, the long-term maintenance of the control systems. So working with Mike, our company working with Mike, the two of us working together, we are, there is a process, not an event, a process to reach energy efficiency in this building and to maintain energy efficiency in this building. I, I'm going to deviate a little bit from my slides here for a moment. I, uh, I've been in this I've been in this industry for for uh, almost 43 years. I was four when I started. <laughs> the uh, yeah, I'm just Sue knows better than that. <laughs> the uh, she, she, was, she was four when I started. Um, the, uh, but early on in my career, I learned this term called entropy. It sounded like a cool word. Got me mixed up sometime with enthalpy, but it was entropy. And, they, and I said, okay, well, so what does entropy mean? And they'd say, the increasing randomness of the universe. Boy, that made sense to me. I understood immediately what the hell that damn word meant. I had no clue. I, it took me 15 years to learn what the hell entropy was. I think John w might have been the one that taught me. It was rust. That's all it was. Entropy is rust. Entropy is the continual degradation of the systems that you build. Robert Frost, in a, in a, in a poem called Mending Fence, said there's something about nature that does not like a wall. Over the winter, the, the stone walls in the New England where he grew up would fall down and had to be put back up. Without maintenance of both the mechanical and the control system, that wall would fall down. It will become less efficient. The efficiency will de degrade. Sustainability is not an event, it's a process. It has to be followed and maintained. So some of the lessons. This is a lesson that I think Gary learned and it's a lesson that, you know, that we, that we we service, by the way, we service two lead platinum buildings in southern Idaho. We're about to begin the same process for the second one that we did for, for Gary. And we, and we, by the way, we bid that second building and we didn't get that one either. So, uh, but, but when you begin to design a lead building, the building owner has to buy in. They have to make a commitment. It's going to cost them money. Lead doesn't come free. 
It's going to cost money. So they, they have to make a commitment. They have to buy into the concept. And the architect has to buy into the concept. They've got to do some, they have to buy in and make a commitment to that process. And the, and, the, and the engineering professionals that are involved in that construction or the design of that building, they buy in. They make a commitment. They say, this, we're going to do this. And, and frequently, the, the, uh, the construction manager will be on board, they'll be on staff early on, on the, on the pick, and they will commit to it. And they commit to it. But the control contractor is going to be responsible for programming the controls will determine the operations of the mechanical systems, who's going to install, program, and commission those systems, who has to be trusted to do it right, is selected based on who is willing to do the job cheaper than anyone else. Now there's a way to get commitment. There's a way to get buy-in. Who's willing to do it cheaper than anybody? That's, that's who you trust. Gary and I and Mike were having lunch one day, and he said, what, would, what should I do different next time? And I said, well, for one thing, you should bring the control contractor on board. And I, I think that's in that write-up, that, uh, that uh, introduction that Brad gave. Bring the control contractor on board. Get their buy-in. Get, get them on board with the process and, and thinking about what they can do with those controls to m operate the equipment, to make the design work, and to meet the design intent. And he said, how do I know I can trust you? And I said, well, control contractor has to be trusted because I promise you no amount of commissioning is going to get you there if there's not a commitment on the part of the control contractor. I promise that. And so you grant someone trust in that process so how do you know you can trust me? I don't know. I can tell you how you decided you could trust the last guy. You decided you could trust the guy who's willing to do it cheapest. That's, that was the basis of your trust. And I'm not sure that's a, that's a good basis. Mike, these are your lessons learned. He said, gosh, that looks familiar. So what did we learn? Um, <clears throat> It's pretty interesting because it has, it's been a really fun experience. I, I have had, actually really enjoyed myself um, because the, the whole idea of, of committing to the project was, um, it, it, you know, that being a little bit more than a job. Well, you got to take, what am I going to learn from this? You know, every day you go to work, you know, you got to be able to go, okay, I'm going to try to learn something today or I'm going to try to improve on something. Because there's there's a lot of things you could do. I mean, and, and every day we go in there, there, there there's we can, we can improve it a little bit more. And as we go on, um, we're seeing we're seeing that we're getting some feedback. Uh, we're seeing more um, better energy cost. Uh, we're seeing um, better use of the resources that we do have. Um, and we also learned that you know it takes a different type of person that to build something that isn't like everything else in in the area. You you got to be willing to kind of walk out of your comfort zone, um, maybe do a little bit more research, and to, uh, and to be willing to, to take a lesson from, um, and, and then to use that, what you learn, in maybe your next project. Um, we were lucky, because when we first came on, when I first came on, I, did, I it was kind of like a blank slate. I didn't have any preconceived notions of what this building was supposed to be, or, or anything. I wasn't... You know, I had to learn it as I went along. And so as I learned what it was going to be, I thought, okay, well, it could be more than that. I mean, we can do that. Because once you start putting this stuff online, and once you start integrating this into, uh, with uh, computer systems, you know, you could do, we can't, well, can we take the system over? Can we take the pumps over? Can we do this? And we went from a system that, you know, okay, who's just going to do heating and cooling to does our pumps, our chillers, all our air handlers, you know, basically, my days have gotten a lot easier because um, I'm the only person over that building, and so now I can I can actually have some normal days. But it used to be kind of crazy for a while there. Um, it's a lot of equipment to take care of. There's a lot of equipment to make sure it runs well every day. Um, I can get up in the morning, and instead of running down to work, I just go down to my my laptop, and I see how things are going. And in a matter of 10, 15 minutes, I can make sure that everything's going to look good for the rest of the day. Um, make it a point to check in every every couple hours just to look over things. 
but the amount of time I've actually spent on it is probably more of, well, let me see if I can tweak this a little bit and let's see what happens to the results of this. And so it's more of like, well, what can I learn? What can I make better? Um, so you got to get it out of your comfort zone a little bit. You know, you got to be able to go, okay, well, you know, let's, let's try something new. Let's, let's look up in the internet and find out, okay, well, if we're going to change out this pump, instead of just changing out with the same pump, is there something different we can do? Is there a reason why this is breaking down all the time? Maybe we didn't design something just right. So let's look at some different possibilities. And it's been real successful with us. But we're lucky because um, Gary's given us the opportunity to go, you know, just, he just wants to see results. And, and so we've been, uh, we've been pretty lucky in that, in, in that regard. Um, but the bottom line is too, is you know, if, even if we're doing this and people were still complaining every day, we'd be a complete failure. And so you know, it's, if people don't feel the results, if they don't feel the comfort that we're giving them, and um, you know, it, it's not gonna work. Um, so one of the neat things about working with, with, um, with Dave, a programmer who, who really sat down and go, yeah, we can do that, we can give that a try. And on a daily basis, I'm like, well, what about this? What about this pump here? Can, I, can we bring that online? Can I control that? He goes, yeah, well, how, what about that uh, pressure sensor? Can I control that? I'm not happy you know, having it set at that you know, one pressure all the time. I think we can do better. And he goes, yeah, we can try and do that. And it worked. But, the, but it, it took a person saying, OK, yeah, I think we can do it. Because I don't, I don't know how to program. So I was relying a lot upon him. So. Um, very pleased. Um, and the best part of all is that we're not done. And all it did for us is to show us that, okay, if we did this in three years, you know, let's, let's start tweaking some other things. And, and uh, as we get the time, as we get the, because it's still a business, we, we're still, it's not my full-time job, it's just not to make sure that the, and the building is running, besides running well, but to tweak things. But as we go on, we have some extra time, we tweak a few things more, we do a little research. We said, well, what about this? We're in the process now of, you know, of, of uh, changing over to um, um, more LED lighting, which has been a process that really wasn't possible three years ago. Uh, a bulb that would cost us $75 is now down to about $20. So now, okay, now we're seeing that we see some possibilities that we can start doing that and that we can see where it's affordable. Um, so, but knowing these things are out there, doing your homework, doing your research really helps out a lot too. Um, and maybe not just reading the industry publications, you know, doing your own research, look out there, find, find a company that maybe is a little bit different, that is thinking ahead a little bit, and, and um, it, it, new ideas are always good, always good. good. One of the things I would like to make clear is, you know, if I sound like I'm doing a sales pitch for our company, I, I want to make it really clear I'm not. What I'm doing a sales pitch for is the way people select the control contractor. More than any other contractor in the building, other than the, the, the general contractor. They're too critical to, to, the, to the life of the system. A, the, uh, a general contractor told me one time, he said, uh, controls are 1% of my construction cost, and they're 80% of my headaches. And I think about 1% of my construction cost, what, if, if one control contractor is 25% higher than another control contractor, got any math wizards out there? I think it's 25 10 thousandths of the cost of the construction. To buy 80% of the headaches? I don't know if that math works out well. So there needs to be a better way to select the control system and the control contractor that you're going to use that when, when you build a, or design and build a building. The, uh, if a building costs 60, 70 dollars square foot and controls are about a three dollar square foot, you know, depending on the complexity of the system, three dollar square foot investment. A 25% difference in that $3 investment compared to the cost of the operation, just the energy cost of the operation alone, will eat it, will, will eat it up in six months, a year, two years, the difference in the price of that initial selection of the control contractor that was based on 
who's willing to do it for a nickel less? Because that's as quick as you say, I'm going to select the control contractor or any other contractor based on the low bid, then it's who's willing to do it for a nickel less. So again, I'm not making a pitch for climate tech or our company. I'm making a pitch for the process. Think about what's going on. With that, I'm going to ask John, because John is the one who put together all this information for us. John, you want to come up and talk to these folks? Can I ask a question? Yes, you, you may, so as long as you don't expect me to answer it until later. <laughs> I guess I know, you know that the, the cloud of the commissioning agent was talked about. Why wasn't, was that not part of the scope of the commissioning agent to make sure that the controls did work? When, and I'll when jump in and I'll let him jump in. Because you mentioned that they were going to wrong to points and other we, things. Is that we, we had a 10-page deficiency list that was one of the first things we were handed when we got done. This was the commission agent's deficiency list. Now, I, I, I'll tell you, as a control contractor, a 10-page deficiency list would scare the bejesus out of me, you know, but, but that, it was there. The problem was that there just wasn't enough clout in the part of the commission agent to say, contractually, legally, contractually, you will clear that deficiency list before we write you another check. And that was the problem. That, that was, the, that was, the, that was the, the, the mistake. Did Gary have that power? Hmm? He did, but there was, uh, things were getting fuzzy at that point in time. And frankly, I, I've never asked Gary why the hell he didn't do that. Uh, at some point in time, he just said, I, you know, I've got issues. I'm not going to dig back into the past. I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm just going to go forward. I'm going to go forward. And one day he said, I, I understand we made a mistake in the first time in selection of the control contractor. And I said, I don't want to ever hear you do say that again, Gary. Because that, that doesn't matter anymore, does it? It doesn't matter anymore. We're just going to go forward. We're going to make this thing right. And that was, that was his commitment, and that was our commitment. So any other questions before I hand this out to I see one thing oh, about, the, yeah. about the commissioning agent. Um, I don't even know, the commissioning agent is a rough job. Um, you come in after the fact, and you're supposed to magically make things oh, okay. That's not the way commissioning agent is supposed to be. No, I'm, say I'm, that, saying, yeah. I know, I'm, well, I'm saying the report <laughs> at, at the end. Um, and this is how this one came in. And the report came in at the end. And by then, it was almost too late. It's almost like a commission agent. You almost, it's, if, he's not, if he's not part of the process from the very beginning, I don't see how you could, it's, I don't see how he can do his job effectively. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I don't know if in the future, you know, a commission agent is going to be um, a, a separate part of it. I mean, it, it's, it's gotta be from the very beginning and he's got to have a lot of control over what happens. I don't know if you want to call him a project manager in the future, but the way the process came out and the way you know things were, um, it, it, it is really hard in the real to, to to get people to come back and fix things after the fact. Okay, it is it really hard. If you come up and say, "Well, this sensor is not right," and it was installed three months ago. You know, it's hard to get that guy to come back. Um, and so that's why it's got to be a process, like you're saying. It, it, it can't be at the end. And unfortunately, a lot of our stuff came at the end where we had the commission reports, and everything was done off the commission reports. Um, and so that, that, that whole process didn't work. Um, and, and like Gary said, in hindsight, if he had to do it over again, uh, he would give the commission agent uh, much more clout, much more power, and, and the ability to say yes or no to things without you know, having to run it through Gary first and, and kind of this roundabout way, well, this guy said, you know, this is the report, we need you to fix these things. Is, did you have any other questions on that, or is that? Uh, no, I, I uh, you know, Mike, we work on the Banner Bank, and uh, we worked on a project at Gary's right after the Banner Bank was finished. Mm -hmm. He chose not to use a commissioning agent on that project. Mm -hmm. And I know you've seen the side of Gary. I think he had something he needed to save a little money. So right then he could save some money, you know, as we're seeing now, later on is when you pay for that. Exactly. And that's a good point. You know, and, and unfortunately it's like anything that finishing work at the end is, is uh, you know, if you don't get it done in the very beginning, towards the end, funds start getting a little bit tighter. And if they're going to cost, if they're going to cut costs, 
tends to be towards the end, which is probably one of the more important times in the project. Because if you don't finish it, I mean, you could spend, um, and you could spend 99.9% of the time, you know, getting building built, but it's that last 1% that finishing that really give, leaves the impression on everybody else. So that finishing, the, the commissioning, uh, I, I think it's huge. So. Is there another way to um, contract with the control system um, contractors? You know, because it, you don't know if it's gonna work until the very end, until everything is installed, right? But meanwhile, you're paying them for, you know, 25% complete, 50% you know, that's a really good question, and that, that's one of the, uh, when we're talking about the lessons learned, um, uh, buying into the whole thing, you know, making sure you're committed from everybody that works is huge, because, um, you know, if your job is just to put up a piece of drywall and walk away, that's all you care about, that's all you're getting paid for. I mean, that's, that's how you make your living, okay, so, um, and you can't blame it, that's, that's what you're paid to do, and so there's, they're probably, for systems like this, which in the end, end result, you know, like some, one person like me taking care of it or, or have the ability to control of it, there, there's probably is gonna be something in the future changing. But once again, once, once funds aren't there, the, the bottom line comes up, um, you know, things change when people have to start writing checks. So I, I wish I could answer what the future would, would be like, but I, I'm hoping it would change. Um, I don't have the power to do it. I, I know that doing the, the way we do things, or the way thing, you know, I have to have permission, can we get you know, money for this, or can we get a check for this? And, and I'm really kind of cautious about spending money unless it's, you know, I look at it twice, well, do we have to do that, or is there a better way to do it? You know, and it might not be a cheaper way, but if I don't have to replace that pump in two years, you know, if it's gonna last a bit longer, or if we're, if there, I can do some kind of redundant system where I'm getting more benefit at it, we're trying efficiently, you know, so I, I'm thinking twice about things. So, but yeah, I, I wish there was a different system, but that's, it's like our electric system too, so. First of all, I just want to say that uh, I, I, can, I can vouch for the fact that he's cautious about spending money. The, uh, so I'm, I jumped up here to answer a couple of questions. One is, as you know, go back to the question about the commissioning agency chose not to do with it. You know, Gary's not unlike a lot of us. Sometimes it takes a couple of thumps in the head before you realize that you're standing under a low ceiling. So, they, you know, I, I would hope that Gary would not make that mistake again. And going back to the, is there a way to select it? Yeah, there is. Uh, we, we have an office in Boise and we also have an office in Portland. And I would guess that probably 30 to 40 percent of our jobs in Portland are selected by, on the basis of a request for proposal that typically includes prices. It's not just a request for, for uh, qualifications, it's a request for proposal. It includes prices and, and price is a, is a weighting factor on it. But there's also other weighting factors and, and, um, and now I will do a little sales pitch here <clears throat> because I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pitch the concept, the, the selection concept, the process. Uh, we, we, I have taken um, RFP specifications from, from a, probably a, a dozen different jobs and I've gone through and I've tried to pick out what I think was the best, the best aspects of them. And I put together an RFP specification, it's 10 page spec and all that, and it doesn't specify controls, it just simply specifies how you, how you respond to this request for proposal. And then there is a, an Excel workbook that goes with that that, that allows you to look at multiple things. Uh, uh, it, it, it has a 500 points a, a, a maximum. 200 of those points will come from pricing, but not just the, simply the first cost pricing. It's gonna come from the cost of, 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 a, of a maintenance agreement, a service agreement that is specified what that looks like. It's gonna cost from the, come from the cost of a, of a service call in the future, and then how much you're gonna inflate those service calls in the future. So this is a commitment on the part that this is, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna give you a price and I'm not gonna beat you up in the future. 100 points comes from just simply interviews with existing customers uh, of that same control contractor because uh, if they didn't do it well before, they're probably not gonna do it well again. If they did do it well before, there's a good possibility they do, will do it well again. And then finally, it's just simply the, the, the impressions of the selection committee uh, in looking at them, interviewing them, talking to them, their impression of what, 
uh, of who is going to fulfill that commitment, that promise. So I think there is a better way. And, uh, and we, we're, we're, uh, we're doing control projects right now that we're, we're, we're done based on the on RFP in the public works arena. And we were not the low bid on, on either one of them. So it, 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 there is another way, a better way. Well, I wanted to, I started looking at the energy figures on this building just earlier this week, and uh, there had been some uh, data logs uh, assembled back in 09 and into 10, but my first order of duty was to get uh, as much data as I could, and I, I brought it up, up to date, up to September 10th, I've got the, those monthly billings, and then I went back three full years. And that covers uh, the two years that the controls have been in place and operating. And then that, that third year back is what I would call the baseline year. That's when it wasn't operating so well. And to compare uh, the usage, I'm using this uh, energy usage index. It's in uh, units of uh, 1,000 BTUs per square foot. And if you're familiar with that, you know, you take the electricity and you convert it to BTUs. <clears throat> you take the natural gas, convert it to BTUs, and in this case they had uh, geothermal hot water and you convert that to BTUs. You add them all together and divide by the square footage of the building. And it's a good way to compare, uh, you know, buildings to buildings and it's a good way to, uh, way to compare buildings over time. Because uh, it's based on an annual basis and you can track buildings over the years. And you can, you can see uh, if you made changes. Well. So this baseline year, that in index number was 87.1, and the first year operation with the new controls, it dropped rather dramatically down to 71.9. But then it keeps dropping, uh, and that's due to you know, the operator learning uh, about the building, learning about the controls, uh, you know, optimization, trying new things, and, and you know, squeaking out a little more energy savings out of that. So that's quite a sub substantial reduction from 87 uh, down to 65. However, this building is about 180,000 square feet. It's a nine-story building. Uh, the under energy cost this last year was about 180,000. I mean, it, it uses a substantial amount of energy. Uh, over these three years, and I'm, I'm going to put the first year as a, as a one, and what I noticed in looking at all the energy records is that the, the total bill didn't go down much. In fact, it, it went up a little bit. So I start looking at the, the data a little harder, and I put it here to get perspective. Uh, even though this energy usage has dropped dramatically over, over the th two years, the energy rates have gone up rather dramatically. Now, electricity went up, gas went up, and then down, and it, uh, geothermal follows, uh, you know, the gas rates, so it kind of follows that. But there's also seasonal aspects to these rates. And what the net outcome was, was that the energy bill stayed exact about the same. But had you not done the improvements, uh, you know, your energy bill would be much, much higher. <clears throat> the main uh, thing that was, uh, you know, impacted was the geothermal hot water. And, uh, you know, they get hundreds of thousands of gallons per month. And so over the course of the first year, uh, they were using 11.5 million gallons of geothermal hot water and paying, you know, for every gallon. Uh, there was a, t a tremendous reduction in that hot water usage when they went to the new control systems. Uh, they were able to, you know, heat that building without using so much of it. Uh, and then they've improved it even farther, uh, down to that 2.6 in this, this last 12 months. In terms of uh, savings for these two years, had they not done uh, these changes, and just left the building operating as it was three years ago, uh, they wouldn't have recognized these savings. 
So you see, in just two years, if you add, add those savings together, uh, that's about $62,000. That's not bad. And these savings will continue, and they may even get, get better each year going out. <coughs> uh, this energy utilization index in, in uh, KBTUs per square foot is, is what a lot of people use. The Energy Star program uh, has a rating system to uh, you know, compare buildings across the nation. It's a national program. And they've got a, uh, a free database where you can enter buildings if you have the, the appropriate energy data. And you can see how your buildings compare to other Energy Star uh, ratings. And Energy Star has an award. Uh, they have a rating system that they show you, they give you the national average at 50%. And then out of, out of all the buildings in their database, uh, the Energy Star target is to attain a 75% level. In other words, 75% uh, or 25% of the buildings are above that, and 75% of the buildings are below that 75 level. And that's called the Energy Star target. Well, you can see this building was not reaching the Ener Energy Star target in that first year. It was only 72. And so here's a lead platinum building and when you compare it to the national uh, tracking system for energy efficient buildings, it's not living up to it. But you can see in the last two years, uh, it's gone beyond the Energy Star rating. And in this last year, it's got an Energy Star rating of 80. That's a pretty respectable rating. But is that the, uh, that the end of it? I don't think so. Now that there's controls in the building, uh, I think there's other things that can be controlled. There'll be new optimization techniques tried. And uh, you know, there are Energy Star buildings out there with a 90 rating, or even a little bit above that. So I think this is uh, you know, just a second year you know, in a continuing evolution of this building's energy efficiency. So, I think I'll let Darwin wrap up on that. I think I mentioned earlier, John and I, when I first worked with John, he was the, the energy management engineer in the energy management office at Idaho Power Company, where I've had the good fortune to work with him. Usually it was good fortune, sometimes it wasn't, but you know, most of the time it was. So. Um, I had a fun thing happen this afternoon after, after Mike left, we, the two of us working together trying to put something together for this evening. And I went back to my de desk and opened up my emails as I just was last before I headed down here. And Kent Johnson uh, provided me our closing for today. I want you to notice the, the time and date on this email I got this afternoon. 3.35 this afternoon, just before I got in the car to drive down here. And Kent said, looks great so far this heating season, which just started with the lowest volume of water used by the Banner Bank building for in October. I couldn't help but note in reviewing the sheet today how the amount of water used on a square foot basis has dropped from 68 to 15 gallons per square foot in the last three years. Most of the building on our systems, air handler, uh, with central air handler systems used in the range of 35 to 40 gallons per year. Kent Johnson Public Works, City of Boise. So again, I think the topic is continuous improvement. I think that continuous improvement is what we see, what we're going to see. I, 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 just, I just wanted to jump up today because Mike said, oh, I'm just starting on the electrical. <laughs> we've, we've kicked the hell out of the geothermal. We're just starting on the electrical. So this <coughs> building will continue to be better as John said, it's, there's, there's, there's a, you know, we have not reached the limit. We've not reached the sky. One last thing I want to say, I, I, there, we keep talking about the controls, the, the, you know, the, the new control system. I want to tell you that the new control system consists of six routers and a front-end software and a couple of modules because we needed to add some points that we didn't have enough points on the existing controls, the existing backnet control system. All the controls in that building, basically all the controls in that building, are still the original product. They're still the, the ones that were installed in the construction. Nothing wrong with the hardware, it works. 
the, you know, inputs and outputs work. The inputs read the temperature and they read the pressures. The outputs open and close to turn things on and off or they mod to put out a, a modulated signal to open and close <coughs> valves, modulate valves, dampers. Nothing wrong with hardware. The difference is the software and the, and the programmer who is going to make it work. So with that, I'm going to finish. Is there any, any questions that you have for any one of the three of us? I've got a few questions, but I'll let the room you answer or ask some first if there are any. I don't know. You're pretty damn tall. You're probably scared the hell out of the rest <laughs> of them. So, <laughs> so on, the, on the topic that you just asked, are you able, or, or do we need to get it from Gary, to talk about you know, roughly how much in dollars additional equipment was required, or maybe in percentage of the original equipment cost? How much in dollars of the percentage. And I would, be, I would be uncomfortable giving you the cost. Yeah, yeah. I, I will tell you that it was the cost to change it or to, to make it work was, was more than the differential in the cost when it was first bid. Yeah. So it, 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 it cost more money to, to fix it than it would have done to do it the first time, would have been to do it the first time. Uh, the, uh, and you say the equipment. I mean, I'm going to tell you again, this, the, the, all the, the cost in this was, was uh, I will tell you the cost of the hardware. I think there were about $10,000 for the hardware. It was a lot more than that to make it work because it was labor. It was all that, you know, programming, mapping, and, and digging through. Mike reminded me again today that, that he and Dave had to go point by point through the building to identify their points because our documentation was, was just not there. Darwin, well, Darwin uh, well, you've got the mic still. Um, we've we kind of heard a lot about um, the issues of the controls contract, the commissioning agent, the building operator. We've heard a lot about what didn't go right, I think. Um, have you had the opportunity to work on projects that were really successful? And uh, can you give us any, any, uh, any guidance or vision? On how we can be a little more successful with this. What is the relationship during the design process of the controls contractor, the mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, the commissioning agent, building operator? What does that look like when it works well? Okay, uh, yeah, and, and, and now I, 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 will, I will do some bragging now. The, uh, we, we did a project uh, about three years ago in, in uh, in Canby, Oregon, over in the Willamette Valley, and uh, it was again they they were, they were you know pushing the envelope of you know where, what what can we do for control efficiency or for excuse me energy efficiency in our HVAC systems. Uh, they designed a natural ventilation building, uh, uh, you know dampers to allow the air in, controlled and, and and relief dampers to let the air out. No mechanical cooling in the classrooms, uh, which was a bit problematic when they're the only school in the in the district that doesn't have mechanical cooling. So uh, you know you got a, you got a bunch of mad people even before they walk through the door because they know there's no mechanical cooling there. The teachers are mad and the parents are mad. Everybody's mad. And the good news was it didn't work. <laughs> Actually, that wasn't the good news. They, uh, I, uh, I, I, I don't do programming anymore and I don't do project management and, and hell, uh, occasionally they'll let me go make a sales call but they try to keep me away from the customers as much as they can. But I finally, I finally said, you know, I think I get, need to get involved in this when I want to sit down at a table and, and there were two things that impressed me. One was that the fact that the, all the people involved, the, the architect, the engineer, the school district, the commissioning agent, were all uh, kind of exchanging the business cards of their attorneys. That impressed the hell out of me, I promise you. And the second thing that impressed me was that when the superintendent, the school superintendent stood up and, and, and almost with tears in her eyes, talked about how committed the school district was to to building the right project, to, to, to building a good project, and, and, and sustainability and energy and, 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 and global warming and, and just, we want to have a smaller carbon footprint. Now we've got to make it work. The problem was somewhat of a disconnect, good engineer, good architect, damn good control contractor, but the problem was somewhat is the disconnect in, in the processes. And, and, and again, I, I told the engineer, I said, next time, Bob, damn it, you know, get us on board early on and let's kind of help some, figure out some of this stuff. And so, so I went in and, 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 and I basically, I, in my company, I'm no longer what we call a revenue producer. I, we don't bill out of my, any of my time anymore. 
So I sent the engineer on to the next job, and I sent the, the project manager on to the next job, and I said, you guys go earn enough money so that you can pay me. <laughs> and, uh, and, then I, and then I went to work on it, and, and we dug in, and we learned a lot. We, we, got, we, became, we began to understand better what we were doing and, and, and how we had to do it to make it work. We, I, we came up with a really exciting idea. We, we had, uh, it's an inter internet-based system. Uh, we could add enterprise software, and then with enterprise software, I could go out on the internet and I could grab information from the weather service. Because I knew, I figured out early on, I didn't have mechanical cooling. And it can be, Oregon gets hot. I mean, you know, the fall, we were up in the, in the mid to high 80s in the fall. And, and, uh, and I needed some way to get cooling, but the only way I could get cooling for that building was to use last night. So I could overcool this building, so I could get it cool enough, get the mass of the building cool enough so that I could flywheel through the next day. And, but, I mean, how do you know when to cool? I mean, well, today might be 90 degrees and tomorrow 60. You know, this is, you know, this, they're not that much different than ours. The weather can't make up its mind what it's gonna do. But, I, but, I, but we figured out we could go out on the internet, grab tomorrow's for forecast, and with that, make decisions about how we were going to overcool the building at night, to maintain comfort. We got, at the end, we, uh, you know, on an 85 degree day, I had four classrooms that, that actually crept up to 77 before the classroom uh, uh, let out. The rest of it was down in the 74, 75 degree range. So what was right? What was right was we had an architect who was committed. I mean, he was there, uh, you know, when, when we were working, he was there, you know, when to answer questions, he was there to work with us. The engineer was committed, uh, put a hell of a lot of time, well over and above what their fee would, you know, would support. They had a co commissioning agent that was committed, and I was committed. So what's the difference? Commitment. That's it. Uh, you know, we were there to make it right, and we were there to make it, and it work. So let me and challenge that a little bit, because um, the... The last piece that you said in particular is the problem, is that everyone put in more time than they were getting paid, right? Absolutely. And so the commitment is important, but if this is going to be a widespread uh, practice that catches on and is more than a few great stories here and there, how, you know, I'm just trying to challenge you a little bit on how does, that, how does this look differently during the design process so it's not always come back and afterwards and fix this stuff that didn't work right. Well, and, and Mike commented that, that, you know, that sometimes we have to step out of our box. Sometimes we have to figure out what is possible and how to reach, how to reach possible. And, and when we're in this period of stretching the limits, we sometimes have to say, you know, we're going to dig in our pocket and, and, and figure out how to do it. I'm, I mean, if, if you ain't going to dig in your pocket and figure out how to do it, you better go f just bid the, the basic ones. You better put thermostats in, 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 uh, in uh, motel rooms or something. You do something. But if you're going to be in this industry, and if, you're gonna, if we're going to move forward, if all, this, all that early slide I put up, you know, green, sustainability, global warming, if all that is not just a bunch of bullshit, excuse me, the, if that, then, then we better... Commit to it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. It was. It was. Uh, I'll, I'll go back and modify that. Back me up. <laughs> Rewind. Anyway, the, I mean that's uh, that's that's it. Because because in the long term, you know, uh, our company makes money. I mean, we, you know, we we have enough projects that work, but there's some that we have to go beyond. We have to go the extra mile. Yes, sir. Okay, so we still haven't heard an instance where you think a project has gone well from the start. Where everything went well? Do you have one where you can, each one seems like you've gone in and fixed something. Well, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I can show you school after school after school over in the Meridian School District that just went like that. So what was it about the process that we were, we're stretching the edge. In Meridian, we're just, we're doing, the, we're doing water heat pumps, they're very efficient buildings. We do them over and over and over again. So we understand how to make it work. what you're saying didn't happen in this other scheme, like you were brought up more early, or they didn't use the lowest bid, or any of those things happen there? Well, and, and I'll go back, I guess, and use Meridian as an example. We've, we've worked with Meridian School District since we were a company 22 years ago. And, uh, and 
when, when Meridian changes a design, which they don't do a lot, but when they change the design, go to a different type of system, uh, you know, a different type of equipment, different type of building, different structure, there's a meeting. And at the meeting is the school district and the engineer and frequently the architect. And, and there's me. I'm there too. And we have a discussion. And, and, uh, and I don't always catch everything. I, we, you know, we were building, uh, uh, getting ready to, to bid Eagle High School and and I'm kind of going through it just about a week before it bids and going through, I was talking to a friend of mine who was a boiler inspector and we're going through looking at the plans and he said, what kind of boilers got in there? I was flipping back and I said, oh my God. The boilers were at least four times bigger than they should have been. And because the engineer was not familiar with sizing boilers for water to, you know, closed loop water to heat pump systems. We called the, you know, got a hold of him, got, you know, talked to him, got a, 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 a addendum out, drop the size of the water and that works. But so, yeah, I mean, it's important because in that case, it was, it was my knowledge of mechanical, but it's important because we know what can be done and, and controls are changing too fast for engineers to keep up with all those changes. What we can do, what, what's going on? So we, they stretch the envelope, but they just don't bring us along fast enough. We gotta be there because we know what can be done, we know how it can be done and, and how to make it work efficiently. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, I can talk to you about a lot of them that, you know, that went great. I can talk to you about some more that, you know, that were a struggle, but, uh, but they work. They, we made them work, got them to work, and uh, well, so. One of, the, one of the things that the benefit of the Meridian is the long-term commitment, right, and the long-term building on previous, uh, previous knowledge. And, yeah, I think it's a pretty unfair question, really, to ask anybody. Uh, is, you know, point a project where everything worked right. You know, come on, <laughs> let's be real here. Uh, that almost never happens. So, uh, but I really appreciate and, and let me, it. Uh, and I will tell you, if it didn't, I'd be broke now. If, if, they, were all, if they were all banners and candies, you know. So I think it's, uh, you know, I really appreciate your willingness to kind of be exposed like that to some of those questions. It's, those are tough ones to Yeah, I've been arrested for it before. But. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more for Mike before we uh, wrap up. Mike, if you're willing, um, you know, one of the things that I, I see a lot is now we're getting energy management systems installed in buildings, and they sit there and nobody looks at it. Nobody looks at the data. Only maybe if something goes wrong, then a, then a flag gets raised, and we try to use it to figure out the problem. But are there some proactive things? And you know, you talked about 15 minutes in the morning, you click up your phone or your computer. What are the 10 things you look for? What are the three things you look for? And uh, if someone was to have this situation where they have access to this data and don't know what to do with it, where would they start? Um, probably first thing I, I look at, I, I, I probably first thing I, I look at a forecast. You know, and so just so check, okay, well, you know, what's, what's the day going to be like, you know, what, uh, um, and sort of in my mind, think, okay, if I was the system, what, what would I be doing, what should this thing be doing right now, okay, should it be, you know, super cool, should it be preheating, you know, what, what should it be doing, and just make sure it's doing it. Um, and for the most part, you know, um, it, it does, you know, but, you know, there's, there's a little check and balance you want to make sure. Um, there's a time delay, um, you know, we have a system talking with the routers and um, so there, you might get some, might, might get some uh, irregular, irregularities, but you know, they'll, they'll, you know, just get to kind of keep an eye on The 10 things I look for, um, and most of it comes from just knowing the floors. You know, I know like, okay, this floor has a lot of computer systems. So I know what's going to happen when everybody starts putting all the equipment. You know, the energy level is going to go sky high, a lot of heat's going to be produced. I know this board doesn't. This might be a little more countless. So this might be um, kind of a call set. So you have an idea of what's going to happen on each board, and that's just helping you know, see an app like day in and day out uh, in the normal system. Um, and so I know what their needs are. And I guess that would probably be the most important is just know, you know, in advance, okay, I know that's probably by 10 o'clock in the afternoon, you know, it's going to be a day in the you know, so they're going to need a little extra cooling, a little pre-cooling, um, uh, and a lot of that comes from just looking at the system all the time. Um, 
you want ten things I look for. Well, I, I, <laughs> when, when you when your, your hot lift, what's place. your hot lift look like when you're looking in the morning? You spend the fifteen minutes to check out where things are at. That's well, hot, it's colors uh -huh. because each one is, is color coded. So it, every floor, every zone has a has a uh, has a zone has a. Uh, Sorry, I forgot to use one. Sure. Every uh, a certain color has a certain a certain zone has. Uh, if you want something seventy to seventy two degrees, um, when we reach that, it'll be nice and green. Okay. Uh, if it's cold, it'll be blue. If it's hot, it'll be red. Um, and that's how the, the the information we get from the from the uh, the sensors that are on the floors. So some floors, uh, like the eleventh floor, will have seventy zones, and let's say maybe on the third floor, you might have eleven. And so the first thing you want to look at is okay, what's What's the, what's the colors look like this morning? You know, if we're all red, I mean, that's a problem. If it's all blue, that's a problem. You know, we weren't where we want to be. Um, and take the time to take consideration. If it's five in the morning, you know, and it's going to be 100, feet, 100 degrees that day, you probably want it all blue because you know it's going to heat up. Um, vice versa, you know, if it's 20 degrees out and you know, you know, you want things a little on the warm side. So it just all depends. It's knowing the customers, knowing the, knowing the system. And just and, and knowing what it's going to give you. Um, it's technically not all automated. It's I don't trust it. I mean, as much as everything you said, you know, it's it's automated, but still in back of my mind, you know, I'm a, I'm a little I, I trust it more and more all the time. But to say that I I trust everything 100 percent would be uh, uh, kind of foolish. You know, especially given the tools that we have. You know, we have laptops, we have computers, and so you know, if I got a couple of minutes, why not look at it? Why not, you know. It's, it's not hurting anything just to make sure it's doing it, you know, and that way you know, it's so much easier to be proactive and take care of something instead of getting a phone call saying, okay, this happened. And if you can be proactive and, and kind of see, okay, well, you know, this could be a problem, you know, let, let's, let's keep an eye on it. Um, to say everything is always automated and to have men and women working together in the same office is really tough because I can sit across from, from my coworkers and I'll wear shorts all day long and I'll be hot and she'll have a coat on and she'll be cold. So it is, it's really kind of difficult. We're just talking honey, uh, heating and cooling. Um, it, you know, if you can make everybody happy, God bless you. I mean, I, you are, you, your technique, write it down, you'll make a fortune. If you can make most of the people happy, I think you've got to walk away with it and say, well, this is, this is a pretty good victory. Um, you know, if you judge your day and how many complaints you get and you don't get any complaints that day, I, I can go home and, you know, get some for my wife and kids, you know, and I'm okay. Uh, but you, you, it's, so what do I look for? I, I, look, for, I look for potential problems. Um, I try to, uh, to anticipate things. Um, and then after that day is done, after that's done, um, I mean, I have a lot more responsibilities. I, I do everything in that building. So, I mean, you know, I might have to pull up the floor. I might have to change the electrical out. So there's a lot to do. So the fact that I'm not doing that all the time helps out quite a bit. Um, but uh, completely automated, that's, that's a, that'd be a wonderful concept one day. Well, I guess, I guess my, my whole point was I've actually been there when you were adjusting. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you were there for that bad day. Well, I don't remember. But, <laughs> but I just remember you saying, oh, this person's name, and yeah. oh, they're going to be complaining, and so you'd go in there and you'd adjust, right. adjust the temperature for that, just that person. And so I guess my, my whole point was is that even though you have an automated system, you have you know, your, yeah, your yeah. influence and this, or this way. comfort. If I didn't do it, they probably wouldn't notice, but I... You know, you we, this is, is a business, and there's a bottom line. And the bottom line is, you know, if people are happy, and you don't get a lot of negative feedback, you know, my job is very secure if, if that happens. And everybody, if everybody's happy, everything works a little bit better. So if I know a guy likes to be warm, or a, a woman that just likes it a certain way, and I've got a couple seconds, you know, just to make her happy, it, it's no skid off my back, you know, and yeah, and I'll do it. And but to leave it to completely automated, they're not going to do that. There's a human factor in, every, in, in it, and I don't know if you can ever really take away the human factor. And unless we've got 11 stories, and we've got 700 people close to that, and, and there, there's a lot of stories. There's a lot of different people, a lot of personalities. So, you know, and. 
people get weirded out in the elevators too. So, I mean, there's all kinds of things, you, you know, we've had to adjust the flow of the elevators just because, you know, I had a too fast, too slow, I had to wait five seconds, you know. So it's just, it's a matter of just uh, finding out what works for your building. This works so far, I mean, it works. Well, thank you. I'm real quick make one Go ahead. Comment. Yeah. If you don't plan to maintain it, put in simple thermostats, period. Because if you don't plan to maintain it, it can become an energy nightmare, uh, not an energy conservation uh, uh, measure. Well, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks to Idaho Power, uh, Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance and their Better Bricks program, uh, Northwestern Energy, uh, and of course, uh, our guests tonight. Uh, I have to apologize for Gary who had a kind of surprise trip he had to take out of town. I'm not sure if that was opened up within the show uh, tonight. Um, so he wished he could be here, and uh, uh, thanks again for coming, and uh, we'll see. I think we have one, one more session, uh, maybe two. I'm sorry, I don't remember the next day of the next session, but uh, it's on the agenda at the back of the room. So we'll see you soon next time.